Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to what is essentially the final session of the Horatius uh, annual meeting. I'm delighted to be with you. I'm Nick Gowing, and I'm sitting in London, but I'm joined from virtually the four corners of the world by uh, some leading voices. We want to reflect. We want to reflect on what has been said in the last 12 hours to find out what we can take away. Now, this is going to be very eclectic in many ways. We want it to be conversational. We'd like you to come in as well, so you can go to the microphone uh, on the screen. We've got 45 minutes. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to Lord Karen Bill Moria in a moment. But what I'd like to do is get each of my other guests to introduce themselves. Deborah, first of all, you're coming from Massachusetts. Yes, uh, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Deborah Wynn Smith, and I'm here in Marblehead, Massachusetts, right now, the, the birthplace of the American Navy and storied in our history. Um, I'm the president and CEO of the U.S. Council on Competitiveness and the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils. And my work is really about how to drive an agenda for innovation, for sustainable growth, and inclusive prosperity. And delighted that I'm with this very distinguished, exciting group of um, panelists for the closing plenary of the race. Of course, want to congratulate uh, Frank Jurgen Richter for his vision, his imagination, and his leadership, and you, Nick, for what I know will be a very stimulating conversation. We'll give you a verdict at the end, not at the beginning. Deborah, thank you. Um, let me go now to California to Lifritz. Hi, good afternoon or good evening to uh, all. Uh, I'm sitting in Northern California, just outside of uh, San Francisco. Uh, uh, for many, many years, I ran a logistics services company, which was global with 10, 12,000 people. And it's a very large logistics company. Around, yeah. yeah, around the world, happily. And, and uh, uh, I did that for a long time. Then I got into humanitarian aid because I saw that humanitarian aid, the logistics, the supply chain, the support of humanitarian aid was very similar to what I saw in the logistics industry in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and worked for you know, 20 years and still do that. Uh, since then, I now run a winery and a variety of uh, vineyards here in Northern California, make Pinot Noir, uh, you know, and Chardonnay. Uh, I, I joined Deborah in, in uh, you know, thanking, uh, you know, Frank and also to say I've done a lot of different things. I look forward very much to the uh, conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Now let's go to Kevin in Paris. Uh, pleasure to join everyone tonight. Uh, so well, despite a background uh, in microbiology and, and cognitive science, I've uh, pretty much identified as an artist for the past 30 years. Uh, my work deals primarily with uh, matters of identity and value. Uh, I work at the intersection of art and technology, leveraging uh, technologies like uh, artificial intelligence, uh, blockchain, and other decentralized technologies um, to, as a method in, in making my work. Uh, and, and at the moment, uh, uh, during this pandemic, has been a, an especially uh, active period for reasons we'll probably get into a little bit later on. But a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, Kevin, you call it crypto art. Is that right? Yeah, the nomenclature is odd, but that's the one that people seem to have settled on. Uh, it, it, it means different things to different people. It could mean that your work thematically is tied to all things cryptocurrency or cryptographic. Uh, in my case, it's because I do use cryptographic technology uh, as a method to make art and decentralized technology. Um, Thanks, in, in, a, in a sort of novel way. Okay, lovely. Um, Karen Bill Moria, Lord Karen Bill Moria, you've just actually come from a meeting um, in the British Parliament. So welcome and thanks for, thanks for joining us and thanks for making time. Um, I want to ask you about the kind of things you've been focusing on and Deborah uh, and uh, Lynn and, and Kevin can jump in. But first of all, could you just uh, highlight what you're doing now, not least for the Confederation of British Industry? You have something, you have a, uh, you have a TV which really makes it look as if you do 14 days in a week. <laughs> Great to see you as always, Nick, and lovely to share the platform with my colleagues. Uh, really, really good to be here. And Frank, like all of us, I thank Frank um, uh, and Horas for all that you do. It's absolutely remarkable. Uh, my position as uh, an independent crossbench peer in the House of Lords, 15 years now I've been there. Uh, and for the last year, I've been president of the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry, which is the largest business organization in the UK. And it's been an amazing role. And it's, it's, it's quite a privilege in any time, but now at this time in history to be President CBI with the Brexit that came to an end in December, uh, with the pandemic that no one forecast, uh, has been extraordinary. 
And in fact, just today we had our annual general meeting where I've been re-elected for another year. So I'm halfway through my, my tenure and my presidency. And, and the highlights, there have been many highlights, but one of them uh, was last month when I chaired the B7. So we've got the G7 meeting taking place here in Cornwall in the UK. And the B7 uh, is the business organization like the CBI, the US Chambers, for example, MEDEF in France, BDI, G7 countries, premier organizations. We also have South Korea, Australia, um, South Africa and India and business Europe. But we always say we may have left the European Union, but Britain will never, ever leave Europe. So we're still members of business Europe. And we had a most amazing meeting. We had Dr. Ngozi, the new director general of WTO. A formidable, you know, a formidable lady. Formidable, indeed. I mean, she's been a uh, finance minister of her country twice. She's been foreign minister. She's worked for the World Bank for 25 years. And wait for this. Look at the serendipity. She was head of Gavi before taking over this role. So she knows all about what we're experiencing. An amazingly impressive individual. And her messages were very, very stark. She said, I've got to reform the WTO. In fact, one of our members said that WTO is in its last chance saloon. And we were all unanimous in saying no more protectionism. I mean, the world has been more and more protectionist over the last decade. And we've said we've got to roll back this protectionism. Uh, and the proof of that, I mean, 2017, over the G7 countries, 50% of exports have some sort of tariff or non-tariff barriers. That's increased by 30% in 12 years. So we've got to stop that. Another really impressive speaker we had was uh, Dr. Geeta Gopinath, the chief economist of the IMF. And she said something that's very stark as well, backed up by Dr. Ngozi, that the recovery from the pandemic is going to be a two-track recovery around the world. There are countries like the United Kingdom, the United States, that offered huge support to our businesses in per capita and absolute terms. UK, 400 billion pounds of support that has saved millions of jobs and millions of businesses. Our unemployment rate here is only 4.8%. It was 3.5% before the pandemic. And the reason for that is this huge support that's been given. On the other hand, many, many countries in the world have been zero support, have not been able to support their businesses and citizens at all. And the other thing that Dr. Gopinath said is the vaccination program. And the UK's vaccination program, which we're so proud of, starting with Kate Bingham being appointed in May, and the first vaccination in December, and the United States is also doing very well with vaccinations. Those of us who have been able to vaccinate at speed will be ahead of the game, and we might have this coiled spring recovery, as Andy Haldane, the chief economist of the Bank of England, said. So that was a stock revelation. And Dr. Ngozi said, look at Africa, 17% of the world's population, and yet only has 0.15% of the world's vaccine manufacturing capabilities. And then just the other side of it is the vision for the UK. In a time of crisis is when you can actually look long term. Yes, you've got to survive the moment, but we also got to look long term. And at the CBR, we've just released our Seeds the Moment, which is our economic strategy for the United Kingdom for the next 10 years. 700 billion pounds of opportunity uh, that we can seize over the coming decade. And it's been very well received by governments. And that's all about the decarbonized economy, an innovation economy, a globalized economy, a regionally thriving economy, an inclusive economy, and a healthier nation. And, and we, that's what we're focusing on. You're muted. <laughs> Nick, we can't You're muted, Nick. Boy, you, you, can, you can actually look forward 10 years, can you? Um, in, in, you're, you're that confident, are you, given that it's only 15 months since COVID began? We are. We have, and this is it. We are very, very confident. The G7, the B7 meeting, we focused on digital. We focused on trade. We focused on climate change. And, you know, we've got so digital. One of our participants said, thank God for digitization in this pandemic. Look at what we're doing right now. We would not have been able to do this 10 years ago, but there's a big but to it. The more digital we get, the more vulnerable we get, particularly with regard to cybersecurity. So, you know, these are huge issues that we've got to deal with, but they're also big opportunities. Yeah, I muted myself because there's still a little feedback from somewhere, so I'm trying to minimize that. But Karen, just before I go to Deborah uh, and, and Kevin and Lynn, um, just to help me understand, because Frank has asked us to think about the impetus for shared global development. And I put the emphasis on shared there. And we're talking before the G7 meeting call uh, on, on Friday. We're meeting before a meeting of the um, uh, NATO. We're seeing gatherings coming together. But from you in your position, do you believe there is a spirit of shared development or not? Very much so. So the example I gave was trade. We've got to get the WTO back up and running as the multilateral platform for trade that we all, all support. 
then you can have your bilateral deals as well, which we're doing. You can have your plurilateral deals. So, for example, we want to join the UK, the CTPPP, which is 110 billion pounds of trade and 11 countries there. We've got a tilt from the UK to the Indo-Pacific. Huge opportunities there. And then another opportunity, vaccinations. This cliché term, we're not all safe until, no one's safe until we're all safe. We've got to help each other. The United Kingdom has got 400 million doses for 66 million people population. We will have spare vaccines and we've said we will share them around the world. India, even before it was vaccinating its own people, conducted vaccine diplomacy, sending tens of millions of doses around the world to neighbours, including to UN peacekeepers. The vaccination programme has got to be done through the COVAX scheme together in a shared way. Even the manufacturing of a vaccine, each vaccine has hundreds of parts and ingredients to it from many different countries and many different locations. You've got to have a free and open sharing of all that. And that's another example of the shared future. So I can give you many, many examples, but we've got to do this together as a global community. Look at the taxation deal that's been dealed with, the minimum taxation 15%. That can only be done on a global basis. Now the G7 agreed, let's see if we can get the G20 to agree and the global community to agree to it. All these things happen if we all work together. And, and Ireland, and Ireland too. Well, Ireland's got 12.5% <laughs> at the moment, yes. Yeah, yeah that's true. I, I hope your optimism turns out to be as infectious as COVID, because... Uh, <laughs> well, Deborah, Deborah, Deborah your, your, your business is competitiveness on the Competitiveness Council. Karen, thank you for that for the moment. Do you share Karen's very positive outlook, even if it's bummy at the moment? I, I just have one comment, and then I want Deborah to hear from Deborah because she has much more content and context than I do. But what I was delighted to hear of all of the commentary and the enthusiasm, the two of the world leaders that he took most note of happened to be women. And I, I think, <laughs> and I don't think that's an accident, and nor do I, but I really think that's an underpinning of really a shared reality or a success on overcoming some of the fragmentation that we've had worldwide for, I mean, for centuries and the rest of it. Deborah, to you, that's the only comment I had. Well, it's, a, it's delightful to hear Lord Karen and his, not just his enthusiasm, but the way he synthesizes complex issues in a way that we can really understand and see the potential. But, you know, competitiveness is really all about how nations deliver prosperity and productivity to their societies and add value over time. And, you know, while we're in a low productivity, period, what's very exciting coming out of the COVID pandemic is that this is one of the of global history's inflection points. You know, I, I should have mentioned I, I'm a Bronze Age Aegean archaeologist. So when I look back and think of the uh, 430 BC plague in Athens that really led to the end of the Peloponnesian War and, of course, the Antonine Plague in the Roman Empire and just think of England at the end of the Black Death, you know, the beginning of trade guilds and, and labor, I mean, the whole foundations for the Renaissance and our modern way of life occurred during these crises. And we're coming out of one now. And if we think of infrastructure very, very broadly, the infrastructure of people, the infrastructure of this incredible technology development and explosion, the infrastructure of investment and talent and how we bring all these things together in a collaborative way, I think we can really move forward. Yes, to address big, big global challenges, you know, moving to a zero carbon world, but decarbonizing manufacturing. How are we going to deal, you know, with the issues around ensuring that the global population has have protein rich diets and water? All of these things are a perfect storm for innovation, for innovators, and shared collaboration. And I have to say on the, the vaccine development, and you know, this is not my area of expertise, but look, in less than a year, these RNA vaccines were developed that were a fusion of digital biotech, nanotechnology. It's unbelievable. And the manufacturing of them and the rollout and deployment. And we did that. We proved that Yes, we can telework, we can teleeducate, we have telehealth, but we also learned a large swath of, of people in the world don't have access to this infrastructure. And I really believe that we collectively think that's a human right to have access to the digital platforms that are essential for learning and working and participating is essential for everyone. So we have to make that happen. It's not going to be done by any one country. It's going to be done 
in terms of the global commons coming together around that. So what is your fear about inequality, though? Because I think as well, Karen, that was part of your B7 discussion. Well, at, at the end of the day, inequality really, and it's true throughout human history, is exacerbated when there's not equality of learning and equality to access of learning and equality to the infrastructure that lets people learn. I mean, if you if we really move to teleeducation and, and the major universities in the world are doing this, not just in the US, and have the physical connectivity, children can learn all over the world and think of the, I mean, we, we refer to this at the US Council on Competitiveness, it's the democratization of innovation and it's really Im imploding. And, you know, in the work we just did, which I think mirrors Lord Karen's wonderful study at CNI, our, our major report, competing in the next economy, the new age of innovation really sets the platform for this. And so the inequality can't just be solved by a distribution mechanism of wealth and resources, but giving people around the world the tools and capability to innovate and to really contribute. And yes, you know, there, there are big challenges, of course, in Africa, but I'll tell you in the United States, we can no longer have the centers of innovation just in Silicon Valley, in, you know, where I am right now in the Boston area, Austin, we have to have it across and through our entire country. And we have to do this in the world as well. So I'll, I'll stop there because others I know want to jump in, but being an archaeologist, I want to come back to that, you know, before we conclude and, and really, uh, I, we, you and I have talked about this, Nick, think back yes. of Aristotle. <laughs> let me pick up. Karen, I'd like you to come back in a moment, but let me hear from, from Kevin and Lynn first. Kevin, how related to your work is this? How related to your perspectives is this when you do your crypto art? Well, I I, I, uh, I touch uh, a, a number of people in uh, in the tech sector. Uh, I think they relate to my work. Some are not uh, particularly we're not particularly uh, interested in art or, or art collectors, uh, but there's something uh, some component of what I do that resonates with them. So I uh, I find myself uh, in discussions with uh, some of the great innovators. Um, whether it's Elon Musk or, or a number of the big software platform heads that we, we all know their names. Um, and uh, I, I think, well, first off, I think that the pandemic has accelerated uh, the use of, of, uh, uh, vir of, of virtual technologies, uh, like we were talking about working from home, uh, at, at, uh, school tele tele teleeducation, um, also decentralized technologies, and the acceptance uh, of virtual assets, and uh, not just uh, virtual goods as as sort of practical objects, but as as stores of value. And now this is a you know a hotly contested issue about cryptocurrency um, and uh, and and decentralized technology, uh, things built on on the on the blockchain. Uh, but one of the things I'm really excited about, and, and definitely speaks to a shared uh, a shared global development is how um, uh, you, you can create a, a decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, in the news, all the headlines you, you see about NFTs, non-fungible tokens, these pieces of art that are essentially crypto tokens uh, existing in the blockchain that are connected to some media. But they're, they're sort of, I want to say they're dumb, but I mean, they're, 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 they're not intelligent. But using the same technology and embedding some collective intelligence through uh, a, a, an autonomous organization, uh, bringing together communities to, to gather around a, an electronic node, if you will, from all over the world uh, to, uh, to, to vote and make decisions. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, for me, what's interesting about it is much of what we're talking about, you, you're, I'm hearing a lot about uh, government's role and, and, and how... Uh, Perhaps in the near future or in the distant future, the government will get their act together and everything will be grand. Um, but in the meantime, I think there are, there, I know there are people who are leveraging technology with an eye towards making up for some of these governmental shortcomings. Um, I myself with a project, uh, it, it was a digital art project, and uh, the collectors of my work had no idea what they were, what they had in store for them. But over time, um, th they discovered that uh, if they wanted 
they could get a year, this particularly applies to people in the United States, they could get a year of free medical insurance uh, or their premiums paid for. And if they, they, they could afford that, and, they prob- and most of them could, they could then uh, delegate that to uh, someone else in need, someone uninsure- uninsured around the world. Um, and, and this was a sort of a proof of concept. But I'm seeing uh, AI, play, you know, deployment of funds, excess funds going into a decentralized pool and being deployed, whether it's microloans or um, it, it's just making up for inefficiencies, human inefficiencies. Uh, and is, is it clear value. what value there is to digital art at the moment? Can you put a value on on something like that or not? Quickly, if you can. Yeah, well, in in the same way, it's the same discussion around uh, traditional art. Uh, you know, how, why does a why does an oil painting have value? Uh, the nice thing about uh, this digital art connected to the blockchain is you have a chain of provenance. You can authenticate. You can actually you have something that you can actually claim ownership. Uh, you can also, which I think is a little bit perverse, is engineer scarcity for the sake of uh, increasing value. <laughs> And I can see Deborah nod- nodding agreement there. Let me come, Lynn, um, after your tribute to, to women and the importance, and I'm sorry that there is a, 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 an unhealthy bias towards men on this yeah. panel. I would give up my position if, if there was a woman available to do this at this time. Um, uh, and what's your view about the kind of thing we've been saying, particularly with, with what we've heard from uh, all three of our guests on right. the panel? I, I, I really share uh, Deborah's uh, enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, I should say, her commentary uh, regarding that this is indeed an inflection point. Uh, everything that Kevin just said underlines that as well. An inflection point that, you know, the world's gone four years, five years in advance of any place it would have ever been, you know, without the COVID and the rest. So much of it is digital. I uh, Certainly, I've been in the logistics services business and used to be that if you could go from one factory to another factory to a warehouse, this was more than good. And that was really the underlying basis of great logistics and services and supply chain. Well, it's not anymore. Clearly, uh, now you have to deliver to an individual at his or her convenience, <laughs> not at the shipping company's going to be sound sort of small, but it is a absolutely, uh, uh, you know, seminal, uh, you know, change. And, and uh, I, I really agree with the uh, with the uh, blockchain. I love the blockchain for the same reason. I mean, there, I, I like it because it is distributed. And if we're going to create a world where there is going to be uh, a truth and some kind of lack of fear, it's all because information will somewhere be the same as opposed to the early fragmentation that the, uh, you know, that uh, technology has afforded us through social media and many things that were discussed during the courts, you know, of the today's or yesterday's you know, meeting, uh, but the more it is distributed, the more it is accessible, the more that it is clean. And I hope AI and other technologies will assist this cleaning up, if you will, as opposed to fragmentation. So I truly agree in this inflection point and would be delighted to talk more, but I I, I, uh, I could certainly say from the... Lynn, 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 Lynn does, does, does blockchain, uh, with respect to supply chain, factor into any of your work? Oh, yes, it is. Oh, my goodness, yes. I, I mean, you know, to me, uh, I, we, I, have, I have an active uh, logistics company now called Linco as well, uh, you know, that uh, is mainly in domestic supply chain, domestic meaning U.S., sorry. Shows you how broken mm-hmm. we can be. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, and we utilize some of the blockchain technology at the moment, and we look to increase it. Uh, in a significant way over the course of the years, more as we go to the international. But yes, to answer your question, simply correct. Right, Deborah. For it's huge for the integrity of supplies and 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 ensuring there's not counterfeiting. I mean, in the pharmaceutical area, to know where ingredients come and what they end up, and to have, you know, still no surety of that. I mean, the blockchain is has profound implications in food products and everything. Correct. I should, say, I, could, I should say, Kevin, that Annette Neist, a former Dutch cabinet minister, has emailed, where can I access Kevin's artwork? So um, <laughs> you, you, can make a, you can give a free plug to wherever uh, she can get rid of it. Well, you can, you can Google me and only believe 10% of what you read, or you can go to kevinabosch.com and it's all true. Oh, all right, there you are. Exactly. All right, you can all advertise whatever you want, including beer, I think, Karen. <laughs> but 
given Karen, given the enormity of we've got twenty minutes to run. Given the enormity of what, what is going on, and at the CBI you have a net zero conference day next week, which underscores the enormity, the enormity of the challenge for all our societies. If you think it's been bad with COVID, wait for the climate emergency, which is now catching up so fast. And what I'm trying to get to in the next 20 minutes is Frank's question, what are the critical forces needed to maintain impetus for a shared global development? How to ensure we can achieve equitable growth and well-being? And I'd like to add existential survival. I'm coming round to asking, do you believe that leadership really grips the enormity of what it has to confront now and the sacrifices that are having to be made and will have to be made by every society? Karen. Absolutely. Uh, there's no question about it. We've got COP26 coming up. And, you know, we've said, uh, let's say this is a watershed moment for the world. It's a watershed moment for the UK. We've left the European Union. Brexit's happened. We're in this pandemic. But we're leading G7. We're hosting G7. We're hosting COP26. We've got to show leadership. And business has got to show leadership. And what I've seen in this pandemic is business has been showing it's a force for good. Since the end of April, I've been working with the CBI team to help with the crisis in India the awful, tragic COVID crisis in India that came out of nowhere. We thought, I mean, if you look at it, in February, everyone thought India had beaten COVID. The, the, the sad deaths were less than 100 a day in a country of 1.4 billion people. And look at what happened. And British business rallied around. It was phenomenal. The, that, that amazing compassion and immediate willingness to help uh, on a partnership basis. So I've seen that firsthand. Now, one of the things Deborah said was, about the importance of clusters. And I would go further to universities and business working together is so important, and government working together, collaboration. And I was speaking in the Environment Bill yesterday in the House of Lords, and I quoted, I'm going to read this out, I quoted the Das Gupta Review by Professor Partha Das Gupta, which is on the economics of biodiversity. And he says, nature is our most precious asset. And finds that humanity has collectively mismanaged its glo global portfolio. Our demands far exceed nature's capacity to supply goods and services rely on. And then I concluded my speech quoting Sir David Attenborough, you know, great hero, of all of ours, and, a, and a, another Cambridge alumnus. And he said, he described the review as the compass that we urgently need. He said, economics is a discipline that shapes decisions of the utmost consequence and so that is to us all. But the Das Gupta review at last puts diversity, biodiversity at its core. And he says, this Im immensely important report shows us how bringing economics and ecology face to face, we can help to save the natural world and in doing so, save ourselves. And to Deborah's point, we can only do this if we have education. And I was uh, at an event with Professor Mashelka, famous scientist from India, and he has a formula, E plus O equals F. So education plus opportunity equals the future. So education's absolutely the key. I would, can, I would, you I teach would, people, can you teach people how to value human life? I'm curious because I think that's what we come down to is we're so quick to ascribe value to, to things. We say that boy is full of potential, that girl, she's worthless. Uh, and yet when there are things priceless like human life, I feel that uh, somehow our value systems uh, sort of shut down. Uh, education has to be at the at the at the core of that, because uh, until we value human life, it's a nature is nature. What was the quote? I was writing it down. Nature is uh, price, what it was. Nature is uh, essential or whatever it was. Precious, precious. It's precious indeed, but so is human life. It's priceless. So, um, maybe, can we teach people to to value human life on a global Deborah, scale? Let me just add to that. Is there pressure on the use of the word competitiveness in your council's official name? In other words, is competition destroying value? Um, you know, we really haven't had that issue in the U.S. Council, but I do think it's an issue when you look at, the, at, at globally, because in some contexts, competition really refers to antitrust policy and things like that. But, you know, just building on some of the, the comments that have just been made by Lord Karen and Keith and, 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 and Lynn, you know, one thing that also came out of COVID is that we regained our appreciation of nature and of, of family and personal life. I mean, the health issues that came out, the mental health issues of people who were unfortunate enough to have to live, be alone in the pandemic. Yes, maybe they were connected on the one side and then, you know, rejoining 
around things that are very valuable, making a meal. I mean, we're talking about women here. And so I'll, I'll make a, a comment about women. I can't tell you how many of colleagues and friends of mine, women, but also men returned to doing very serious in cooking and loved it and got pleasure from it. And all of those things that make us human beings. And so, you know, when you think of going forward with competitiveness, I, I think at the end of the day, it's about providing equal opportunity. You can never guarantee equal outcomes. Let me just tell you, you're, you're stirring. Lynn, Lynn can, I, can I just say that you're stirring good debate on the chat line? I just need to reflect some of it. Sergei Chabani saying that the pandemic has awakened humanity from slumber. It's letting us see the real consequences of ignorance, populism and bureaucracy, stupidity of some governments. David Goldsmith urging us the discussion should be about improving life on Earth for all species, not just human life. It's an ecosystem, and certainly that's central to David Attenborough's point. Lynn? Absolutely. Yeah, well, I, I go back to Lao Tzu on that one. There's no doubt about it. I mean, we're all a very, very small part of a very large, complex universe. We're all common. Uh, I always laugh when we talk about race relationship in the United States because, God, we're the same race, for goodness sake. I mean, the fact that we're utilizing... Uh, and inter, in, you know, interrupt the thing. The, the, what I wanted to actually ask Deborah and, and Lord Karen a little bit was that we've had, because we, although we've had a lot of good movement just to spur the conversation, uh, in the last, you know, four or five years with Brexit, it looks like it was a little interruptive of hegemony and, and peace and equanimity in general on a political stage. We had, uh, the, you know, the sort of the foster of uh, fostering a uh, fig of, of all globalization, which is the, a benign, a relatively benign uh, United States going just absolutely taking it upside down and in many, so many ways trashing it or looking, or at least appearing to trash it. I'll be trying nicer. Uh, is, is, has the impetus of this negativity I uh, been uh, looking to be overcome, Lord Karen, uh, from your uh, uh, vantage point in the UK or uh, yours, Deborah, to say that uh, because of COVID or these other factors are, are hopefully uh, overcoming this because it was a big fear to us. And we've got the G7 coming up, so I'd love to get Karen, to Karen and Deborah quickly. Yes, so, so you know, it's, it's, it's so many manifestations of this. I mean, if you look at diversity and inclusion, that is so important around the world. We, we talk about gender diversity. Um, what about race diversity? I've launched an initiative at CBI called Change the Race Ratio that is championing ethnic minority participation across all business. And, you know, McKinsey's surveys have shown the top quartile of companies that embrace diversity and inclusion are 39% more profitable than the bottom quartile. Deloitte have shown that companies that are more diverse and embrace inclusivity are more innovative. So it, 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 it's not just the right thing to do, it's, it's the best thing to do. So we've got to champion this. And I, I, I really believe that that is happening in this crisis uh, as well. Thank you. As we pass to you, Deborah, let me put this comment from Ananda Setio Ivananto. How can we be sure that the stock market acknowledge the limitation of planet Earth? Wealth can be virtually unlimited, but Earth doesn't. Any comments? Well, and that, of course, leads into this whole real transformation around ESG metrics yes. and looking at sustainability really writ large. And it includes the equity, the diversity, it includes all of these things, not just, you know, one dimension that is that is perhaps, you know, maybe the most important at all of all, which is the environment and and climate and things. But sustainability and investors are very much concerned now about who they're investing in. And there's quite a, a revolution underway in the United States. It's extraordinary. Older. I mean, just last week, there there was a major upset with um, a small hedge fund, Engine One, who basically uh, managed to put three new directors on Exxon Mobil that are very much aligned with sustainability and and the renewable uh, non fossil fuel world. And so it is happening. And and, and I that was against that was against the wishes of the chief executive. Yes, and I have to say that the the chairman of the U.S. Council on Competitiveness, Brian Moynihan, who's Chairman and CEO Bank, Bank of America is leading, actually developing these sustainability metrics for who they invest in and how and helping the transition to a more sustainable environment um, writ large with, with the, their clients and things. So I think it's very much underway. And if you look back at total quality management, 
Um, and, you know, we had something called the Malcolm Baldrige War where companies learn, you know, how to actually reach these metrics through a process. But at a certain point, it became table stakes. You weren't going to be in business unless you had total quality management. And I think the same now is going forward with sustainability. You're not going to be in business unless you embed in your top policies all the way up all of these metrics and behaviors. And so it's an exciting time. And, and, and I think that corporate leaders, as Lord Karen says, they know it's good for their business and they know it's good for the, their communities and the world at large. And we kind of lost that connection. Used to say, well, I have to share this. When I first became you know, the CEO of the US Council on Competitiveness some years ago, we used to say, well, what's good for a corporation is good for Americans. And we found out that's not true. You drive through large swaths of our country and you see communities that have no jobs, who have every, everything shuttered down. Unlike in Japan, where Jap Japanese corporations always put value on their employees, and we mm -hmm. didn't in the United States. Kevin, what's your perception of this? Before I go back to Karen, what's your perception of whether things are now moving incredibly quickly, incredibly quickly, even though they will be inadequate the, given the enormity of the climatological threat? Uh, with respect to uh, employment, I'm concerned. Uh, I'm not sure if if uh, if we're going to have enough jobs. Uh, I'm fascinated by universal basic income. I, I'm not. I don't really have a position on it, but I'm I'm really interested in it as as a concept. And, and uh, I know some people rolling it out in in uh, small locales in the states and testing it out. Um, look, the, these issues uh, they're all important, right? They 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 you can't not one not not attending to just one of them isn't going to fix everything it's a, they've all got to be in, in like an orchestra we've got we've got to we've got to have them all in sync and 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 i like the idea that that corporations are uh, uh, understand that it's in their best interest to do the right thing um but I, I think that a lot of that has to do with engineering the situation or putting certain uh, uh, engineering certain stressors so that doing the right thing also means they yeah they take a hit in their pocketbook if they don't do the right thing. Thanks. Um, I've got a comment here from Stuart Hutton. If we continue to not understand what we need to do, we will lose the way. And he's backing what you've said about education, Karen, why education is so critical. But let me just pick up on what we've heard Kevin say there, both Karen and Deborah. Are you seeing a dramatic change in understanding, and I'm being very simplistic in order to make a point, among leaders, not just at big companies, but also the small and medium-sized companies, the SME, the small and medium-sized enterprise. We're talking about the need for a massive change in the way people live and work. And that question from, from, from Kevin there, this fear, particularly in Eastern Europe, that actually going green means losing jobs. Now, Biden and Kerry have made it very clear. It's about creating jobs. Well, it's about creating jobs. When the Prime Minister addressed us at the B7 with Boris Johnson, he said the race to net zero is not a zero-sum game. And in true Boris Johnson style, he said green is good. And, and you know, there's no question about it. Investors are looking at this. Um, you know, another two facts from my speech, environment speech, that the devastating ecological toll estimates that we would need 1.6 Earths to maintain humanity's current way of life. There's been a 70% drop in the population of mammals, birds, fish, reptiles, amphibians. Around 1 million animal plant species, almost a quarter of the global total, are believed to be threatened with extinction. This is the reality that we're facing. And business has to lead from the front. My alma mater, EY, Ernst Young, this year in the middle of a pandemic said we're going to go carbon negative this year. That's but are they getting it? Karen, be, be clear, you're president of the, of the, the CBI. Do you believe a massive number of, of, of entrepreneurs really get the enormity, even if there's financial pain until there's financial one, rescue? One third of our largest companies in the UK have already committed to net zero by 2050. This is the leadership business has got to take. It's not just talk. You've then got to walk the talk. And they're doing it. Deborah. Right. You know, I, I, I will say it also relates very much to, I just sort of threw, you know, mentioned this in passing, but dematerialization. And so it's not just the fossil fuel industry we're talking about. It's, you know, mining writ large. I mean, look at what's happened to Africa 
where a continent has literally been taken over for mineral mining and what it's done. <laughs> you know, from blood diamonds all the way up. And, you know, here we have the in Bitcoin and, and bit mining, all this, you depend on rare earths, the power, all of that. We need to be innovating. And I'm very proud that the work's underway in the United States and we're teaming with, we will, with other like-minded countries, the UK, Australia, Japan, and others for synthetic materials. I mean, talk about environmental degradation and how it impacts. If, if, if anybody's ever seen a mine for rare earth materials, you think you're back in the worst stage of human civilization. You know, people, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. So the whole sustainability has to be looked as an integrated system. And carbon exactly. is a piece of it. But look at methane. And what's the largest producer of methane? Rice cultivation. So are we going to say overnight people can't eat rice? It's a very, very complex set of things. But I do think that industry leaders are understanding it. And they're the ones that are going to be taking the investments and the steps to really take us there. Government can have regulation and mandates. But at the end of the day, it's the private sector that's going to create the jobs and the innovation and the things that take us forward. And I'm, I'm very, very optimistic about that. Um, and Lynn, Lynn in, in, Cal in California, you are a stressed environment, a oh. stressed ecosystem. Yeah. And particularly after the fires and everything else, yeah. does California now get it? The governor assured me a few months ago, yes, we get it. The, yeah, California does get the seriousness that we're in. I can speak that in, in winery and the precautions and the reality that we're, we're facing. The, the one question I would like to ask the panel, because I, I as the one business guy here, and been doing this for a long time in a lot of in an international environment, I really agree emphatically with Karen and Deborah and, and the rest to say these forces, technology forces, societal forces, ESG forces, business forces are really commanding, you know, the changes and the uniformity and the sharing that we talked about. Are we good enough? Are these enough pressures to, to pressure the political forces? Uh, you know, because when we talk about competition being shared now, I'm still one of the big competents is, you know, the U.S. against this, this against that, Mexicans against this, certainly Europe against this, Hungary, Poland, you know, to go into Europe uh, and, and all this vicious, you know, self-creating populism of uh, fear mongering. It's all about us and screw the other people. Excuse the expletive. All right. Well, let me put that to Deborah and Karen. And I think, uh, Kevin, we're going to have to end at that point. But do you believe the leaders are getting this? Deborah, are you seeing, are you optimistic? I hate using the word optimistic and pessimistic, but do you see positive signs which make you feel there's an accelerator at work? an accelerator which is moving in the right direction at a speed which actually quite surprises you? I, I do in certain parts of the world. And in other parts of the world, I do not at all. And, you know, we have a very interesting comment coming in on chat that there's been no discussion really about Asia. I alluded yeah. to Japan early on. Well, we could talk for another hour. Karen talked about the Indo-Pacific Alliance and how st strategic that is. But, you know, you can't talk about climate without bringing Brazil in and their issues there. So, you know, developing new principles, new compacts of shared human values and really walking the walk and enforcing it has to be done, I think, to make to, to move forward on this. Otherwise, we're going to just be shifting things around. And and I want to just make a comment before we include and, and turn it over to Lord Karen, maybe for, for his final remarks. But. I alluded to Aristotle, and Aristotle, Aristotelian ethics are so relevant to our world today in the future because what he articulated was that the ultimate purpose of being a human being and all that we do is to flourish. And we can't flourish without all the things we're talking about here. And that's the universal goal to flourish. Without uh, Kevin, do you, do you agree? Just before I go to Karen, Karen do you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yes, Aristotle ethics all the way. And that's, loud, that's a great line, <laughs> Karen. Let me just tell you, Stuart Hutton said, "Is there a copy of your speech available yet?" Well done, well said. This Thank is you. really interesting. E plus O equals F. But your your final thought about yes. whether the mountains are moving. 
And, and, and you know, we all live it. In my own business, Cobra Beer, I've, the mantra that we have is not just good enough to be the best in the world. You've got to be the best 